Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for July the 17th, 2020. This is episode number 15. Today, we'll be talking about the Nissan Area making its debut. Uh, the BMW iX3 has been revealed, and Tesla Model Y standard range has been canceled. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Joining us today, we have Tom Logney, multiple EV owner and Inside EVs editor. And we also have Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, available on all your usual podcast platforms. And we don't have Kyle Connor with us at the moment. He is on a trip. He is somewhere out in the wilds of uh, North Dakota, maybe around the area of Minot. Minot. And um, But if you go to his out-of-spec motoring YouTube channel, you can see a video of his adventures so far. And maybe he'll pop in. We'll, we'll see what happens. So welcome, uh, gentlemen of the panel and ladies and gentlemen of the audience. Uh, lots to talk about today. But before we get to the big news, let's see uh, what we have charging up in our driveways this week. Tom, you had you don't have anything this week, but you had the BMW i3s last week. Yeah. Um, so the i3s uh, went back. I had that for a few days, as I mentioned. Uh, I think we briefly went over it in last week's pod, uh, podcast. I did the 70 mile an hour range test with a 2019 BMW i3s. We went 141 miles at a constant 70 miles an hour, pretty good. The EPA range rating on that vehicle is 153 miles per charge. So we got pretty close to the EPA range rating, which is always pretty good when you do that at a constant 70 miles an hour. Um, you know, uh, uh, I've always been a fan of the i3. I've owned two of them. Uh, but not with the latest battery pack. BMW has had three batteries in the i3 since it came out in 2014. It was launched with a 21.6 kilowatt hour battery pack. Two and a half years later in 2017, they increased it to 33.2 kilowatt hours. Now in 2019, it came out with a 42.2 kilowatt hour battery pack. So BMW has done, you know, while the car has never been a super long range vehicle, they have made these incremental battery increases, which has, you know, made the vehicle a lot more usable for their, their, their customers. You know, when it first launched, it was a little disappointing that it only had 81 miles of EPA range rating. Um, but uh, again, you got to go back to 2013. There weren't very many cars with much more miles than that other than what Tesla was offering. So in any event, yeah, we did the range test. And in other BMW news, which we, we just actually posted, uh, it was yesterday, I think, on Inside EVs, uh, Sandy Monroe of Monroe & Associates, that the famous company that does these teardowns, they just did a huge series on the Model Y, which was kind of fascinating. It was the first time Sandy actually did a video series while he was tearing down cars. But he's been tearing down cars for, for decades uh, and back in 2014, when the i3 first came out, he did a comprehensive teardown of the i3. He sells these reports to manufacturers. Uh, at the time, he said it cost him a little over $2 million. That's wow. how, you know, in-depth his teardowns are. He literally takes every single part, measures it, weighs it, categorizes it, and then it can come up with exactly what the car costs to build. So we made this report back then, sold it to pretty much every manufacturer that was out there. Now, you know, it's five years later, not too many people are interested in buying an i3 report. So he's offered it for the public for $10. Now wow. these reports sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars when they first came out. So it's a it's a really, really cool report for 10 bucks. I urge any, you know, EV or just automobile enthusiast to go to uh, Monroe and Associates and order this thing. Now it's a digital report. You don't get the 30,000 page printed report for $10. It's the paper would cost more than that, but you get it in digital form. And uh, it's really interesting. I see Martin has already ordered his. What do you think about that, Martin? Yeah, I love it. And actually, you know what? If he'd given it away, if he'd said, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm doing it as a free download, I would have just added it to my to-do list and never really got around to it. But I think because he said, look, I'm going to put it on for 10 bucks and, you know, you can have it for, for, you know, for $10. It was just the right price point that it was a no-brainer. I mean, if it had been 50, I probably would have, you know, paused a little bit, but as a as an EV enthusiast would have would have done it. But I think so many people who who just, as you say, casual interest in electric cars and cars in general. Now, I've brought up one slide here from my version, but I got, you know, my my internet banking on my 
watch pinged away as the order went through. And, you know, I'm in the UK, so it works out like eight pounds. It was just, you know, that's like a sandwich and a drink at lunchtime for <laughs> almost 30,000 pages of, as, no, as Tom says, it's too deep for anybody but an OEM. It, unless you want to know how that BMW was made for a business reason, it's too deep because every screw and washer is taken apart, weighed, measured, and Sandy gives his best idea of what it would have cost at the time, because obviously this report right. written in 1415, there's some pages here marked 2016 as well in, in some of the pages. So I wonder if it's updated over the years as well. And you just don't need to know that, but a car maker would, like the opposition would want to know what it, what it's costing. So I think I've read, there's eight or ten sections. Um, let me check. But um, uh, there, I've read the first few pages. Uh, there's ten zones. Uh, let me quickly tell you, body structure, exterior, rolling chassis, battery, electronics, cooling, drive line, the Rex, the range extended engine, the combustion engine, uh, interior and seats. And so uh, I, I think I've gone through the first few pages of each of those, and then it gets super deep really quickly. But it's ten dollars. I mean, it, it's 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 an absolute bargain for for really interesting insight. I've got one slide here on 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 zone four, which is the battery, and this is just one of the first pages. So you can see the you know the pack, the uh, the the charge cable that goes inside. There's the probably an inverter in there somewhere as well. Like really, really interesting. And what's interesting, as as Tom says about the i three, at the time it was space age technology. In 2020, it's still space age technology. So uh, especially in terms of the chassis and how that's built and the materials used i think you're going to find that really interesting as well i haven't gone through you know one percent you know, half of one percent of it yet but I'm, I'm i'm excited about reading it whenever i can i was going to try and print out a few pages it's too much so i'm just going to read it as a, as a pdf um off my screen you can go to sandy um i think it's a monroe live.com or, or you can find sandy's site and and, and do it yeah, sandy monroe m-u-r-n-r-o yes yeah. So, so you start off like with this this slide here, and then then there's, it goes into each component and like tears them apart or something. I mean, yeah, it's great. It's okay. it's you know, um, uh, and then he adds his his cost in terms of there. But yeah, this is uh, I don't even know what page. This is page thirty five of two thousand <laughs> six hundred pages on the battery alone. And, oh, you this know, is and, the battery. Oh man. Yeah, and like he he tears until he can get no more like he tears everything apart so i can see why it would cost his business two million dollars to make it with staff and equipment and, and and everything that you need to go through uh to i mean i can just scroll through here uh, right. uh just to, to show you the first few the first few pages and things like eye-catching features these are interesting slides because you can look at things like the cooling of the you know the battery and 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 how uh, the, the the systems work at least on the on the i3 and uh and, but i mean look part numbers, steps, fastenings, and all the hours that it would take to put together the process time. It's it's too deep, but it's brilliant. Um, right. go, and buy, go and buy yours. He could end up making a lot of money Maybe, out of this. Yeah. yeah, so, and good on him. Right on. So one thing I'd like to point out that many of the uh, followers might not realize is manufacturers do this all the time with every vehicle. Um, you know, I, I was talking to a colleague at BMW a few years ago, and um, they told me that, uh, at least over in Germany, the German automakers like Volkswagen Group, Mercedes, BMW, when a new car comes out, any new car that BMW makes or Volkswagen makes or whatever, they just automatically ship copies of them to their competitors for free. Um, they have this agreement where, you know, um, here's our car, here's our latest car, go ahead, do your best with it. Um, I, I think they get two of them, one to drive and one to tear down. So the manufacturers do these teardowns. They want to know what you know, the other manufacturers are up to, what they're doing. Um, but if, if, if I, I don't think they always do this level of, of detail of a teardown. I, I could be wrong. Um, but so, but, and even if they do, it still might be worth buying a report from Sandy, even if it's a couple hundred thousand dollars, it's pennies to a, a major auto manufacturer to get another opinion on how the, the vehicle is put together. And, you know, Sandy puts, you know, he, he, it's not, it, it's a teardown, but he also writes all the opinions in these reports on, you know, that this could have been done differently or that this right. was a good idea. So, you know, I think it's well worth spending whatever he charges the manufacturers um, to see what the other companies are doing out there. Cause they learn from that and they make their vehicles better. So it's, 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 it's good for the industry 
that that there's an entity out there doing this, uh, you know, that isn't just the manufacturer looking at their competitive cars, sort of like a neutral third party reviewing all the vehicles and giving their input on them. I think that's, you know, it, he's probably, you know, helped make cars better, safer and less expensive by doing this through the years. Yeah, I believe you can go to their YouTube channel and you can see more about what, what he does with those suggestions with a, uh, I think it was maybe club car, the golf cart people. They uh, partnered up with them and they took their product and they tore it apart. Arcimoto. And they, no, they're, you're doing Arkimoto now, but a few years back, I think it was, okay. uh, I think it was club car and uh, like it's just a golf cart. And they just totally changed that product, like top to bottom, just it's amazing. I believe that uh, the video about that is on their YouTube channel as well. Yeah, I mean they do uh, microwaves, and they, you know they do right. domestic goods. So uh, they they know that. I, I was I was completely new to Sandy when he tore apart the Model Three. I distinctly remember watching my first Model Three video where he was so critical and and just thinking. Who is this old guy who hates Tesla? And he was very, very critical of yeah. Tesla. So my first impression of him was, and he, and he was he was brutal at times. Um, but there's so much Tesla haters out there that my first impression was completely the wrong one. And then you watch five and ten videos, and and then I took the time to learn about him, and I realized I was had made a terrible, terrible uh, first impression. Uh, the guy is brilliant. He's so passionate about cars. He's passionate about designing things better. What, as I say, whether that's a, a model Y or a microwave. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. So let's get to some news. Uh, big news this week is the Nissan Aria has debuted. It's an electric crossover with 300 miles of range, and it should have like a $40,000 base price. It debuted uh, in concept form at the Tokyo Motor Show just like last October. And uh, I, I was lucky, lucky enough to be there for that in you know, it looks pretty nice, but the this version of it, the production version, it looks pretty much as pretty much the same. Not not a huge, you know. If you looked at one and you didn't, if you didn't see the picture side by side, you'd think it was the same thing. But it, there are some slight differences. Uh, so, uh, what's your take on this, Martin? Well, look, we, I'm so pleased they came out with a car that was was compelling because we know they're falling out of love with the Leaf, and and that was heartbreaking because they were so early with the leaf yes. and we, and you know 10 years ago you can be forgiven no active thermal management on the battery um and and all those little things you can be forgiven of that and they were learning a lot about batteries as they went so you can forgive them that i'm not not if you're one of the people that own one in arizona and and uh, and had battery problems with them get, getting so hot but i can certainly forgive them for those early learnings but then what happened the last two three years even the leaf 40 the kind of the number two version Underneath that redesigned body is the is the leaf. That wasn't a, a ground up new car. The, the, the running gear is incredibly uh, carried over from the previous model. Then the 62 kilowatt hour version. So, you know, th the leaf is made in one of the three places in the world, in the US and obviously Japan and here in the UK. So again, I got skin in the game. I want great cars to come out of this country. And I was starting to uh, get, get kind of sad about uh, Nissan um, with the Leaf, and so I'm just delighted that whilst the Leaf seems to be off their roadmap now, I think they just that's quietly going to go away. The Aria or Area, however we're meant to say it, is a very compelling car. Quick caveat, by the way, it doesn't come until late 2021, so that's we're talking true. about a car that is over a year away. There's nothing in this car that I see that Nissan couldn't do right now. There's nothing in this car that says. Oh look, you know you can You know, so it happens with Tesla sometimes with the semi truck. Like it's going to go this far and cost this much, and you know they can't do it now. But they're confident in their in in, in like the Roadster, like six hundred miles. They can't do that now, but they're confident about where they're going to go. And so when you look at the at the specs uh, on this uh, of Tom's article that he put up on 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 Inside EVs, uh, it, it's got two battery sizes, two uh, either front wheel drive or all wheel drive. On the two pack on the two pack sizes, so that's the first four specs. Then there's a final top spec, which is uh, the, the the bigger battery pack size, and that is the performance version, which is 5.1 seconds, 0 to 60. How much quicker do you really want to go? How much performance do you, do you really need out of this car? 
It's uh, the right size. It's the right styling. It's the right level of technology. It's not uber high tech, but it has got some nice touches inside. It's got the um, the kind of the haptic feedback buttons. Uh, these kind of buttons that you can see if you're watching the YouTube version of the show. They're on the on the dash. They're flat for the heater controls and 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 what have you. Just rest your finger over them, and you get that little little kind of uh, feedback to say that you've you, you've pushed it. So a nice combination of two big 12 inch touchscreens and uh, some some regular buttons as well. Good uh, a good powertrain and and my only hesitation is, but it's a year over a year away. There's nothing in right. this car that Nissan couldn't do right now. So, but a new platform. Important to say a new platform that Nissan and and Renault and Mitsubishi are going to be able to use as part of that alliance. So it's not like the Leaf, which stood on its own, which is always inconvenient for a car maker. Um, and so. It, the world in a year's time is going to be very, very different. There's a bunch of cars coming in the rest of this year, early next year, that are going to mean prices come down on EVs, people get more knowledgeable about EVs, and this is probably just about... I want to be not too harsh on this car because I'm really pleased with what Nis Nissan have done, but I'll try and be realistic. It's probably just about good enough for what the market will look like late 21. Yeah, I believe it comes out in Japan a little sooner, like like next summer. summer and yeah, summer next year. Right after that is coming coming here. And, uh, so, so you like the the exterior design? I mean, the, the exterior design works for me. I like it. I think okay. it's uh, it's. I, I haven't seen it. It's too divisive uh, online. I mean, for our YouTube viewers, I'll bring a little picture up on it. It's here. like a it's like a digital interpretation of their V Motion. Uh, on the on the front there, you know how it comes to the front lines come down into like a V in the front, which you can see on the on the Leaf now and the Maxima and all the other Nissan pro most of the other Nissan products. Um, but the, the the two things I'm I'm interested to hear feedback from the listeners, you know, in the comments and from you guys as well. The two things are so Nissan have this four wheel drive technology, which is across not just their EVs but across their range, and which is E it is stylized E hyphen numerical four O R C E. So E4 right. ORS. E4 ORS. So, uh, E4 ORS. So it pronounced E4, uh, but it doesn't look like that on paper. Uh, so it's a stupid name for what is actually a really interesting technology. So uh, so E4 ORS is going to be rolling out across. It is already in, in Nissans, but will be in more in their EVs, of course. So right. uh, that's, you know, you could just call it all wheel drive. Uh, or four wheel drive, but uh, you've got to give it a, a fancy branding name. So, so yeah, looking forward to learning more about E4 Horse. And also, well, look, the, the the elephant in the room we haven't talked about is is the lack of Chadamo. But uh, I'll right. stop now and leave we'll, it to we'll, one of you guys. We'll, yeah, we'll get to that in in a second. The E Force is kind of interesting. Um, so, uh, Nissan has, like, I believe, nine or ten electric vehicles coming in, in the next over the next couple of years. So, it, it, we'll we'll see E Force. The name a lot more frequently, and what what that is is uh, it's not like just an all-wheel drive system. So I, I drove a, a Leaf earlier this year that had the E Force drivetrain inside of it, so it looked like a like a new Leaf on the outside and uh, and the interior, but underneath of everything, it had two wheel motor, two uh, two motors, so all-wheel drive, and lots of power. I forget exactly, a little bit less than the the Aria has. We'll get to its numbers in a in a minute, but so what the E Force does so. It's a, it does torque vectoring. So if you're like in a turn, the the inside wheels turn slower than the outside wheels, so you you can make a turn more easy. Uh, also, uh, if you like, if you're sitting there and you stomp on the accelerator, it doesn't like spin and give you all kinds of torque torque steer. It kind of you know mellows out the uh, your departure somewhat, and things quickly pick up steam. It's still pretty quick, like 5.1 seconds for the perform the top spec version of this is is pretty decent. It's yeah, five, under five, under six seconds is is as quick as you really need. But you know, five seconds is going to be great. Um, I, I should probably just uh, I I realized I didn't say what the pa the pack sizes were, so I just called up my notes that I made watching the sure. presentation on uh, <laughs> on Wednesday. Sixty three kilowatt hours is the small one from sixty five gross uh which on the wltp test cycle i didn't write down the epa numbers is 223 miles it'll be less epa the big pack is 87 kilowatt hours that's 90 gross and that's 310 miles on wltp it charges at 130 kilowatts according to the presentation but i read an interview with some of the japanese engineers a little while ago and in that they mentioned 137 so i wonder if some software updates over time are going to make this charge quicker 
I mean, Jag, you have done it with the iPace. And talking of that, yes, software over the air updates uh, are part of the platform. We've got to do these days. And uh, 22 kilowatt onboard AC charging, very useful. They've obviously listened to their consumers and feedback in places like France, where there's just littered because of the Zoe uh, with 22, three 22 kilowatt three phase AC posts. And, and so this can charge on the bigger battery pack. Uh, the onboard charger is is a twenty two kilowatt AC, um, yep. which is really I mean it's really good. That's the, that's I mean, the that's... fastest on the market. You know, t you could offer you could in the old days you could up spec a Tesla and, and get some quick AC, but right, that's but that, brilliant. But that's, in, but that's in the UK. Here, yeah. it's what what Tom is like seven point two. Yeah, here it's it's limited to thirty amps. I think uh, thirty or thirty two amps, seven point two kilowatts, which is pretty slow for home charging. And I actually. Um, spoke with some Nissan representatives about the charging, uh, and uh, and they, you know, their basic their answer was, look, when you charge AC, you're charging at home. It's overnight, so it kind of doesn't matter if it's seven kilowatts or ten kilowatts because the car is going to be in the driveway for ten hours or whatever in the garage. And for most of the time, they're right. Uh, the thing is, you know, you look at what the market's providing now with the competition. Most of the competitors now that are coming out with large battery electric vehicles, 60, 70, 80 kilowatt hours, um, are, are many of them now are coming out with 40 amp or 48 amp uh, home AC charging, which would be, you know, 9.6 kilowatts or 11.5 kilowatts. So the Leaf's going to be a little behind with AC charging. It's not a huge deal. Um, it, it might bother some people, but I don't think it's a huge deal. And uh, Martin, you were talking a little bit about the um, DC fast charge rate. So Nissan is showing that it's 130 kilowatt uh, max rate. But I also um, asked some of the Nissan people about that also. And what they told me was that it can, it can accept uh, 350 amps at 400 volts. So if you, if you do the math on that, that's 140 kilowatts. So that might be the difference, what you talked about with uh, saying it was 137. Nissan might be listing it at 130. So people don't complain about the fact that they can't reach that, you know, which a lot of manufacturers get flack from that. They plug into a DC fast charger and maybe the voltage is a little low. And, you know, the voltage on the pack varies during, um, you know, depending on how full the pack is. And at lower a state of charge, the voltage is lower. You don't you don't always get full charging rate, and you know so people are confused about that. And I think that Nissan might be putting out the 130, so they don't you know put out the absolute maximum rate and have people call in the dealership saying I only got 125 kilowatts and it's supposed to charge at 140. So I think there could be some of that involved with that. And 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 staying on the the topic of the battery, um, you know. Uh, Thermal management. <laughs> right. Yes. You know, we, we don't, it's not, you know, an air cooled pack. It, you know, Nissan is, is putting in a uh, liquid thermal management system. They said it's very sophisticated. It's going to, you know, alleviate any of the problems that, you know, we, we've heard about with the Leaf. And there was a good deal of problems in the warm weather climates. You know, the Leaf actually, you know, I, I mean, I could argue that the Leaf, as, as good as the car was and how it was the first mass-produced electric car, it's also set electric vehicles back uh, because there are so many people that were burned that were early adopters that got Leafs and the batteries just degraded so quickly that they, you know, they sold it and said, ah, forget about these electric cars. The batteries just don't last. And it's right. just not true. Yes, Leaf batteries didn't last, but it's virtually the only electric vehicle that's come out now in this latest wave of, of electric vehicles that has had such de degradation problems. Uh, and, and so in that regard, while the LEAF was a pioneering vehicle, I, I think it's also hurt the reputation of EVs. Uh, and, you know, that's something that's going to last for a while. But um, luckily, it looks like that's behind us now. Um, Nissan's going to have a complex thermal management system. And also, um, one of the things that you pointed out, uh, Martin, but didn't really expand on, um, was the fact that, you know, there's two battery packs. The, the small, the base pack is 65 kilowatt hours. They're allowing uh, the owners to access 63 of the 65 kilowatt hours. Now, in the larger pack, it's a 90 kilowatt hour pack. We're, the owners will be able to access 87 kilowatt hours. That's like, nine, it's about 97% of the pack, far more 
than any other OEM outside of Tesla how close allows, is that? allows to, to, to access, you know. Um, how, how, how close is that to what Tesla does? Well, you know, I don't have, Tesla doesn't release their official right. uh, maximum capacity and, and, and usable capacity. I know there's people out there that have, you know, studied that and, and know, um, but it's, it's close to that. It's, it's a very high percentage. But what Tesla does is they tell you, don't charge it to 100%. Right. They say, yeah, you know, it, you can get, you know, this amount of, 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 of range if you need to on a rare occasion, but don't fully charge it to 100%. Charge it to 80% or 85% at the most for daily charging. They don't even recommend 90% most people on a Tesla pack. So will Nissan do the same thing? Will Nissan at least allow the owners to set a maximum charging level in the vehicle? I really, I hope they do. Uh, I would imagine they would if they're going to allow such a, a large amount of the pack to be usable. Um, and also on the, on the topic of batteries, their, their supplier, which we found out is Ketel and right. um, the Chinese supplier, and they're the large um, um, prismatic cells form. They're not pouch cells like Nissan had used in the past. So they, they went the route of like what BMW uses, the, the prismatic cells and not pouch cells. So, so the- uh, I mean, this is a, Totally, total departure. Then throw into the, then throw on top of it that they're now um, transitioning to CCS for the U.S. and Europe, and this this car has no resemblance to the Leaf. This is they just scrapped everything they did with the Leaf and said we're going totally new, clean sheet of paper. It's not like an evolution of the Leaf at all, as Mark, Martin mentioned earlier, that the second generation of the Leaf was just kind of like the same Leaf with some window dressing. No, they just this car is, you know, it's not even like, you know, a, a brother. It's like, you know, a distant cousin. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, and w- one more thing I want to mention, there's a lot of talk about, you know, a lot of headlines, including the headline that I did on Inside EVs. <laughs> As you can see there, 300 mile range, 400 base price. We have to realize you won't get 300 miles for $40,000. Right. That's going to be the, the small battery. Um, you know, this is going to be a fairly expensive car when you're considering you can get a Leaf today for a little over $30,000 in the U.S. Um, this It's going to be an expensive car. And that's one th- the two things I'm concerned about. Martin brought up one point was that we're not going to Europe and the U.S. isn't going to get this car for a year and a half. Uh, it's going to launch in Japan in about a year, you know, five, four, five, six months later in U.S. and Europe. So now th- th- we're a year and a half out. And it's going to start at forty thousand. I'm sure if you get you know the larger battery pack, you throw in some options, Pro Pilot Two. It's going to come standard with Pro Pilot the One. But if you want Pro Pilot Two, which is hands off, uh, the car will drive and you can take your hands off the wheel. That's going to be an option. It does have a st- full suite of standard features like you know emergency braking, lane departure, blind spot, the cross traffic alert, forward collision warning. All that stuff um, is going to be standard. But if you want Pro Pilot 2, which I'm guessing a lot of people will want, that's uh, that's going to be an option. And then the larger battery pack, this is going to be, you know, easily 50, you know, this is well into Model Y range and, and above. Um, How is it going to compete against the ID4, which I think it's it's really right in the ID4's yeah. wheelhouse. The ID4, I think, is going to be less expensive. We don't have the pricing yet with the different tiers of batteries on the ID4, but so I think that's going to be its head-to-head competition, and you know, it, it, it you know, I, I don't know. I, I like the vehicle. I think it's a great vehicle, great evolution. I wish it came. I wish it came a little bit sooner, and I wish it was a, cost a little bit less. Yeah, there's nothing in this car that makes me think Nissan haven't got the uh, know-how to do it today. Like, then there's nothing in it that's like, oh, we need to, you know, uh, we'll wait for that. That's worth waiting for. They can make this car today. Why is it going to take a year and a half to come to the US? And what is, can you uh, guys fill me in? What's, do I need to mentally be taking off seven and a half thousand dollars for the federal tax credit? Is that going to be here next year? Um, when does that expire? Because obviously that's all gone for Tesla now, um, but it will be around for companies like VW and Nissan. Yeah, the, the, uh, they still have uh, maybe a hundred thousand or so units left on that, Tom. I don't, I don't think so. I think oh, Nissan. No? I think Nissan is um, is closing in. I think they're they're the next um, up to have it expire. Right. Uh, I, I could be wrong, but I mean, I think N- Nissan's sold. Uh, you know, in in the U.S., something like a hundred thirty thousand, hundred and fifty thousand Leafs somewhere around right. there. So, right. 
you know, they had to have at least, you know, I think they might have about 50,000 um, units left on the federal tax rate. We'll have to check what's, that out. I'm sure one of our followers is going to post that. But um, it'll probably be it'll be here, Martin, when 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 the ARIA launches, but it probably won't be here for that long. So, you know, they'll be on a, a competitive disadvantage at that point. Volkswagen will will have it for longer than Nissan will. Certainly. So if you want to get the seven hundred the seventy five hundred dollar tax credit, you want to get your order in early, that's for sure. Yeah. So what, one other thing about the batteries before we move on from that. Um, so these, as you said, are prismatic batteries, which are, are sub, slightly different from pouches. So they're all kind of like self-contained in these cans, but, but they're all, it's almost like having pouches within the, the can. So it's a little bit different. And I'm wondering how Mm, how difficult it is to cool those effectively. So when we're looking at the charging, it charges up to 130 kilowatts, and that, which produces uh, some amount of heat. So I wonder if it'll, you know, th it will have some of the, like throttling back the the power levels early because of you going with with that design instead of a pouch. Any thoughts on that, Tom? Yeah, you know, I know BMW uses the prismatic cells, and I know BMW does throttle back the power, okay. uh, you know, when the cars overheat, probably sooner than many of the other manufacturers do. Kyle and I, um, you know, noted that when we were driving around his track on the um, on the Mini Cooper SE, um, that really quickly throttled back power. Um, and uh, the i3 does it also, if, if you're really, you know, really hammer it for a while it doesn't take long before you start getting reduced power so you know it's a little above my pay grade engineering wise um you know but again this isn't the aria isn't isn't really a i don't think it's 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 a track car i don't think it's meant to be really driven hard you know i think you know right. in the sport version is going to be a fun you know it's going to have good acceleration but i don't think that's going to be an issue because it's not so it, i don't think you buy this car to really you know, put performance as no. on the forefront. It, it, you know, it's made for a market, made for a consumer. Um, I was going to say, oh, yeah, uh, like the e-force thing, besides the uh, torque vectoring uh, and, you know, the lack of uh, torque steer when you take off, it also controls pitch and dive. So when you slow down, you know, you're not doing this and taking off. It like has a, you know, controls which if the if, if you're in the all-wheel drive mode at least, which which motors uh, have are getting the power. So it controls that. So it gives you like a smoother ride. So they're really looking at a very you know domestic audience. It's not necessarily like a you know it's not a sports car, mm -hmm. of course. And it's a crossover, so it shouldn't really be. Um, man, there's so much I want to talk about this thing. One more quick thing I want to add sure. is that it, it is going to offer towing. In the U.S., right. it's going to have 1,500-pound towing capability. In Europe, it's going to have slightly more. That's all I could get out of the Nissan people. It's going to have slightly more. They wouldn't comment uh, how much more, but right. um, our European friends are going to get a little bit more than 1,500 pounds of towing capability. So That's 15, good to know. That's good to know because I was sorry, uh, 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 Dom, that it was, um, it was reported in both ways. Uh, I found t two different releases. It was called 1,500 kilos and 1,500 pounds. Big oh. difference. Uh, huge difference, actually. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'm still digging. Uh, Nissan didn't reply to me when I asked. So that's good to know um, because I, I presumed it would be pounds. I presumed it would be the the, the lower because 1,500 kilos is – that's a big towing capacity. That's a kind yeah. of mid-sized caravan. That's that okay. more than you would think an EV. Oh, I know that like the Audi e-tron and stuff is rated even higher, but um, – for for mm -hmm. this kind of EV, I would I was shocked it was so high, but that would make more sense. But yeah, here in in especially the Nordic countries in Europe as well, towing is for a, um, a trailer or a small or a mid trailer hugely important. So it comes mm -hmm. with that as well. So fifteen hundred pounds that would be like a, a small or moder moderately sized utility trailer, basically not not a camper so much. Maybe mm -hmm. one of those pop up campers. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, well, so I, I don't know. There's so much about this car. But I wanted to talk about like the design from the outside. It, it doesn't. I don't find it really super compelling. It's not like like Ford launched a Bronco th this week. It's uh, with no electricity yet, um, and it's but it's design. You know, it's it's great. It's generates a lot of excitement. This, I think, it's more of a slow burn. It's, it doesn't like grab your eyes, and you know, it, it just doesn't say you know take my money really. But looking at the numbers and, and see how it, 
looking at the numbers and the features and the, the value that's offered, I think over time it, it might be is like you said, it's going to compete with the uh, Volkswagen ID4 probably mostly. It's a it's a little smaller than the uh, than the Tesla Model Y. I think it's like four inches or five inches smaller. It's a little taller also, so and like a, an inch narrower. So it's it's going to have some funky dimensions. Like uh, it'll be interesting to see those two parked side by side. And uh, yeah, the interior is, I think, is pretty gorgeous. I like it. I like it a lot. They have like the zero gravity seats, they call them, and uh, that wood trim across the front with a with a uh, haptic uh, control sort of embedded in the wood, and that wood carries over onto the this, the armrest console and there's a little roll up uh, storage compartment there, and the uh, gear selector is kind of really nice. Man, the only thing about the interior, I don't know if you have a shot of this. Uh, sort of looking down i like i like the um there should be like a separation in in the cars between the front seat and the passenger seat and this one it's hard to tell what's there i think they have some sort of weird storage thing at the front but it looks like it might be a flat floor so i worry about like passengers dropping something and then it rolling rolling down over to the driver's side and you know and could get under it's a, a gas pedal or, or, or worse a brake pedal yeah but it's, it's it's pretty exciting video. I think the sweet sweet spot for this for a lot of buyers will be the front wheel drive version, uh, because it'll be cheaper than the all wheel drive. But you, you'll get the I think that's the one with the most range, like three hundred miles of range. I believe that's the front wheel drive version, and the all wheel drive version might be a little bit less than that because I don't know increased weight and uh, yeah. When Tesla does an all wheel drive version, they sometimes get more range with the all-wheel drive version because they'll they'll make one motor uh, more efficient at speed at higher speeds and the other motor more efficient at lower speeds so they can you know get more range out of it that way but yeah but the, uh, the other big news associated with this whole vehicle is the char demo is is going away in in uh, europe and north america it's staying in japan at least on on half of the vehicle uh, you can talk about that in a second, Tom. So, yeah, that's the other so story associated with this. No more CHA demo, really, or, or no more support for it. So it'll be phased out, and that's going to affect not only the Nissan area and uh, and possibly Nissan Leaf owners, but also Mitsubishi uses CHA demo on their Outlander plug-in hybrid and their older IMEV product that they had. And interesting for you, Martin, the London... Uh, the London Electric Vehicle Company, which makes those funky uh, London cabs that with the, uh, I think it's plug-in hybrid systems they have. They use that as well, don't they? I didn't. I've, you know, I've never stored in the old memory banks uh, what the cabs use because I would just knee-jerk assume that it's a CCS combo plug. But okay. I'm now going to go and look at that to see uh, what they use. That's a very good point. Well, I scrolled to the list of vehicles and I like went to the uh, Chatamo Wiki Wikipedia page, and they have a list of vehicles that are, uh, you know that use it, and they're mostly uh, Japan products that you can't we can't get here. But uh, yeah, that was one of the ones that kind of stuck out. Is oh, that's that's an interesting choice. That and uh, some early zero motorcycles also use some some Chatamo fast speed charging because uh, yeah, it worked out for them because the the uh, zero motorcycles battery pack is a lower voltage, so they have some technical issues trying to get the work with CCS. So that was interesting. So you have some thoughts about this, uh, Tom? So, yeah, I mean, this, this, this article got a lot of uh, um, play. And I remember when yeah. I was on the, the call with Nissan and we were going over the, all the Aria specs, um, you know, when, when, when I realized that it was um, that Nissan was making the transition, that was the one thing that hit me. I said, God, this is this this has to be its own article. Um, you know, this has been speculated for a long time. You know, the, the if you want to call it the plug wars, they're kind. They're, I, I think this is the final nail in that coffin. Um, Chatamo is pretty much you know a legacy charging standard now in the U.S. and Europe. Uh, I don't see anybody coming out with 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 any cars um, that's going to use it. Even some of the manufacturers that. Um, had been like Kia on the the first generation Soul. They switched over to CCS. I think you know. I think if if all the Asian manufacturers had stuck with Chatmo and said this is what we're using, I think that you know that would have cemented Chatmo, and you know we would have been stuck with these multi standards forever. 
But the fact that, you know, manufacturers like, like Hyundai and Kia and Honda, when they came out with their EVs, they used um, CCS. I think Nissan just said, you know, this is, we're, we're, we're swimming upstream. Um, this, this isn't going to work in the U.S. and Europe. And uh, they decided that uh, the best thing for them to do would be to, uh, to drop Chatamo. Now, they're not dropping it in Japan, as you mentioned. Right. Um, every, pretty much every EV uses Chatamo in Japan. That's not going to change unless this new um, uh, you know, China and Japanese standard, I forget how you pronounce it. It's like CJOY something. Um, but that's like a new Chatamo uh, GBT uh, combination it's possible that could change and that could be the new standard in, in Japan. But um, for here in the U S and in Europe, uh, CCS is going to be the dominant, uh, you know, fast charging standard. And um, this just kind of put the nail in the coffin. Now Mitsubishi still is going to be selling the outlander PHEV. Uh, I'd imagine at some point, maybe the next generation of that or the net, the first all electric car Mitsubishi comes out with um, will, will in the U S and Europe after the IMEV, We'll, we'll use CCS and then, um, you know, we'll see the CCS, the, the, the channel stations are going to be around for a long time uh, to support the legacy cars that still use them. But then I think eventually, maybe in four or five years, you're going to start to see those connectors get pulled off and and uh, and swapped out for a different connector. Um, what, I, what I'd love to see Nissan do and what I think they should do for their customers at this point um, is make a channel motor CCS adapter and, uh, and let, you know, let the, the, the LEAF owners um, have the opportunity to charge at either standard. I mean, you think when the Aria comes out, many Nissan dealers now have Chatamo stations at the dealership. That's right. uh, I guess they can, they can swap it out for an all new station and use both the Chatamo connector and the CCS connector, which, which are available. What most of the stations come out now have both, you know, or if, if they were to just tra- transition to CCS, and 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 offer an adapter for their customers. You know they they can do that also. And um, but either way, I think it would be fair for Nissan to offer Leaf uh, owners a um, an adapter. And uh, you know I I think that's the right thing to do. And I, I hope that they do that. So just before I move on, I just wanted to point out that the the area, if you look at the photos, it has you can see has a charging port on the front fender, on the driver side, and on the passenger side. So in Japan. Uh, one side I think is going to be CCS and one side is going to be Chatamo. And, yeah. and then okay. on the US, we only have the driver's side front fender and that's where your CCS will plug in. That's right. I'm so, re- I'm so relieved about this as well because, you know, <laughs> if I had a charging uh, company and it was my name at the bottom of every check that was written, it would just annoy me that we have to have a backward compatibility ch- to Chatamo. And I say that with every sympathy to every Leaf driver watching. I say that as, as, a, as a Renault Zoe owner that only charges on AC. And so not every charging post has has AC. So I feel discriminated against, but it's fine. I bought the car knowing that, that there's not always a, a single type two plug. Sometimes it's just Chatamo and the CCS combo plug, but still, if it was, if I, you know, if I had to pay for charging, uh, for, for, for charges, whether that's a, a 50 kilowatt or 125, 150, a new 350 kilowatt fa- fast charger, and you're paying for infrastructure and all that kind of stuff, the bills get really big, really quickly. And all of a sudden someone says, oh, we better put a Chatamo plug on the end to cater for Nissan. It would just annoy me all the time. You know, I think, well, I'm not going to, th- this is crazy. So as much as it pains me to say, I'm really pleased that that we are we seem to be going towards a more sensible uh, way that uh, these charging companies are going to invest because we need more infrastructure as yes. more EVs come around. We know that we know that people aren't going to that can't charge at home are going to want more charges on the roads out there, and and it just makes a lot of sense just to go with one plug and and then the other things that i got on my twitter this week when i was talking about this it's slightly unpopular opinion that actually i'm, I'm pleased ish that uh, that chatamo is is finally going to be rested apart from the legacy support um and, and that's and that's bi-directional because you know there's a lot of hope placed in things like vehicle to grid and vehicle to home but mm. look that standard has been approved with ccs it's possible uh i, I don't know what the state of the honda e whether I know that it was talked about that the cable the, the it can do bi-directional CCS whether that ever came to to, to fruition uh, with that little car but certainly it's possible with CCS and and we're not far away so that shouldn't be anything that people that it should just should be to make sure that the people that have invested and bought a leaf 
for the life of that vehicle can charge the car. It's unfair to them, but otherwise, so pleased that they've done this. Yeah, right that's on. how I feel, Martin. I, I, I wasn't rooting for either standard. To be, I just wanted a standard. And when CCS came out and all these manufacturers signed up to use it in the Euro, U.S. and Europe, I, I, you know, that's when I started saying, look, this is going to be the standard. At some point, Nissan is going to have to drop this. And I wrote articles on that. I mentioned it in many of my articles. You know, for the last five, six, seven years, and I know there was always comments of people saying, "You're crazy." There's there's more Chatham stations in the world than there were CCS. That's they're right. never gonna they're never gonna drop this. This is gonna be around forever. If anything, CCS is gonna fail. Um, and you know, I, I I I it wasn't like I was rooting. I, I just wanted a standard. I want to simplify this. I mean, you know, you know, it would be great if 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 Tesla. Well, first of all, I love the Tesla connector better yeah. than any of them. I wish everybody used the Tesla connector, but that's not going to happen. Um, and there's the uh, picture we have up now of Tesla in Europe. That's a Model 3 with a CCS uh, charge port, which is what they use now in Europe there. But I don't see Tesla switching in the U.S. Um, to that. I mean, I, 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 it would be great if they did, but I, I don't see them doing that. So what I would envision in the future is, you know, all these DC fast charge stations that have two connectors on them, you know, if they could, it, it, when they replace the uh, Chatamo connector, uh, put on a Tesla connector. So now you've yeah. got a, sta a CCS station, a CCS and Tesla. Now, of course, they have to work out deals. You can't just like Electrify America couldn't just put a, a, a Tesla cable on their to their cars to charge. So they have to work out a deal, an agreement with Tesla That's to right. be able to do that so the, the vehicle can communicate. Now, EVGO here in the US has formed that kind of an agreement with Tesla and they're allowed to put Tesla connectors on their stations. So I suspect that they had this like funky adaptation. What they were doing was kind of like the way it is now, there's two connectors coming off the EVGO stations. They had like a, a, a Tesla cable coming out of the top of it. It looked like crazy, like the design. But I could I could see them now just, you know, eventually replacing the, the, the Chatamo connectors with the Tesla connectors. And I think you're going to see ChargePoint and Electrify America here in the U.S. also strike deals with Tesla down the road to have a Tesla connector. It just makes sense. There's The most electric vehicles on the market are... Our, um, our, our Teslas. So why wouldn't these networks want to service Tesla vehicles? Um, of course they want to, but they've got to strike a deal with Tesla. Tesla wants to control the customer experience. They're not going to just say, yeah, sure, go right ahead, add the connector, charge our customers, whatever you want. Um, so that there's got to be some kind of negotiation there in order to um, assure to Tesla that their customers are are going to have a good owner's experience, a good charging experience. That's right. All right. So let's put the uh, behind the sand. Uh, in other news, we have uh, the BMW iX3 has been revealed as the uh, first electric uh, BMW that's based on like a, a combustion engine vehicle. So it's not like a ground up like the the i3. The iX3 is a, it's a crossover. Basically, it's like the the uh, was the X3, but in electric vehicle form, it's a slightly different. Uh, it looks the same basically, but except for the grill, but it, it does have slightly different dimensions to it. So, you know, if you're interested, you you might want to check those out before you get you know too deep into the buying process. But so it comes with an 80 kilowatt hour battery and 74 kilowatt usable, usable, and um, with a 286 miles on the WLTP, so that'll be a little less than that. I don't know, maybe 250-ish, I don't know, uh, on the EPA standard. And it'll cost 68,000 euros with the uh, uh, value-added tax included. Now, I say euros because it's not going to be for sale in the U.S. So this is going to be like a Europe and China vehicle only, and it's made in China. But if you're in, but if you're in Europe, you know, you, you'll be able to get it for 68,000 euros and it also in germany it'll be uh, eligible for the uh, they have like a nine thousand dollar they have a ten thousand dollar subsidy but because of the price point of this car it's going only going to be available it's going to be eligible for nine thousand of that so that but that's still a great deal that's like a sixty thousand dollar bmw um and it's uh i believe that becomes like loaded as standard so it has all your features it'll be like you know all the features and options already on board 
And it's a real world drive vehicle. So it's, that's it's kind of weird. It's not like an all wheel drive vehicle, at least for now, maybe that'll come in the future. Um, and it's not super quick either. And maybe like, yeah, this thing needs all wheel drive because 6.8 seconds, zero to 60 is, is great, but it's, I mean, it's, but it's not like BMW great. Like the, the gas, the top spec gas version is, is even quicker than this. So it's kind of odd. Usually the electric versions are quicker but not in this particular case. And like I said, it was, it's built in uh, China um, at a plant. It's a, it's a joint venture with BMW and Brilliance, a Chinese manufacturer. And it's coming, they say production is 2020. So that's like this year sometime. Martin, any any news about this? Yeah, they're already they're already making them. I mean, I say, I say making them. I mean, as in pre production um, right. has started, but they're already making them. Um, and yeah, you know, well, if you go look, listen, if you go into the car buying process, and one of the things at the top of your list is how much does the car cost? This isn't the car for you, right? If you uh, so so many people said to me, so many people this week put this next to the Tesla Model Y, and when uh, you're an idiot for 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 saying the BMW is a nice car. And I don't mind being called an idiot, but at least at yeah. least know what you're talking about if you're going to criticize me. Look, as you say, rear wheel drive. Uh, it's not dog slow, but it's it's slow ish. And 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 it hasn't got the best EV specs in the world. It's going to be heavy. It's a kind of smallish pack uh, in terms of, of, of that size car. Uh, the range isn't so good. But none of that matters if you want to buy a BMW R X3. If you're an X3 buyer, maybe you're an X5 owner, or, or or you just you're in that BMW world, or you're in that premium world, and you want a car that is electric that'll charge at a very good a good speed and get you you know enough range. Look at the inside of this and work out the feeling. If you've got sixty grand, if you've got seventy grand, that's before you touch the options list. By the way, the infamous BMW options list. If you've got seventy k to drop, you want to feel good. You want to feel amazing sitting inside a car. Look, there are tech heads who are never going to drive anything else apart from a Tesla. But but there are so many people that are going to get inside this, as, just as the as, as everyone that's bought a Mercedes Benz EQC gets inside it and realizes. It's a stunning place to be inside. The build quality is going to be incredible. Uh, just from the from the pictures that we saw, it just looks such a high end luxury car. You know, believe it or not, not everybody wants a Model Y. So this car is is not going to be the biggest seller. But you know, there are there is going to be a market for this, and it's it's a different set of buying decisions, and it won't be for people that walk in. With price at the top of their mind, I you know I like it again. It's not it's not for me because I need to shop on price. I don't have that kind of money to spend on this. But there's plenty of people that will do, and this 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 will tick this will tick the box for them. It's by far and uh, you know by by any means it's not a cutting edge car. Do you have a shot of the interior you can show us? Yeah, let me bring that up. Yeah. Hey Tom, um, what do you think of this car? Do you like this? So well, I do like the X3s. I just had the plug-in hybrid version of the um, X3. And, uh, you know, I, I really enjoyed it. You know, the X3 is, is, uh, is really a great little um, SUV. You know, I'm not sure exactly what segment exactly. Of foot. I think it's, it's compact or midsize. But um, it, it, it really, it, it ticks, as Martin said, ticks a lot of boxes for a lot of owners. Now, the all electric version of it, I'm, I'm sure, will be even better. Um, you know, it's got an 80 kilowatt hour battery. 74 kilowatt hours is usable. And that goes back to our conversation we had a little bit earlier about the amount of battery that Nissan's allowing 97%. I think BMW usually allows around 90, 92%, which, which this seems to be in line with. It's got 150 kilowatt DC fast charging, which is very robust. Okay. It should be able to charge, you know, up to, up to 80% in about a half an hour. Um, you know, it's, it's got, it's going to have decent range. Uh, you know, it's unfortunate. It's not coming to the U S I think that has something to do with the tariffs. I mean, this is, this is going to be, I believe it's going to be the first car that a BMW has ever exported out of China to, to sell in different markets. I could be wrong about that, but I think that's the case. Um, one of the things I wanted to correct you a little bit on earlier, Dominic, was how sure. you said that this was the first um, converted uh, you know, gas uh, all-electric car that BMW offered. Uh -oh. You forgot about my Active E that I drove oh, in 2012. Right. <laughs> to 2014. Now, yes, that wasn't available for sale, but it was retail vehicle that was available for lease. 
And uh, I happened to be the first person to, to take possession. There was a big handoff ceremony where the president of BMW gave me the keys of the car. So I have the distinct honor of being the very first retail customer that ever took possession of an electric BMW. And that'll never change. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, what this car does have is, is it's the first um, vehicle to come with v, uh, BMW's new flexible architecture, which allows for electric plug-in hybrid and pure um, ice on the same uh, assembly line. So is there, it's, a, is, it, is there a diesel version of it? New architecture. BMW has been flip-flopping back and forth with how they're going to make their cars. From 2009 you know, and 2010, they were saying dedicated platforms, BMW i, the only way to make an electric car is to make it purely electric, skateboards, yada, yada, yada. Five years later, well, you know, we think the right way to make electric cars is this variable platform architecture where we can on the same assembly line make electric, plug-in hybrid, and gas. And so that way, if there's more demand for plug-in hybrid, we make more of those. If there's more demand for electric, we make more of those. It's simple. We can instantly respond to what the market offers. I don't know. That was 2016-ish when they said that. Right. Maybe five years after they said we dedicated platforms is the way to make EVs. Now, I don't know if you notice, there's been some rumbling lately. I think it was just this past week where some BMW executives are saying, we've got to make dedicated platforms. <laughs> so, you know, in, 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 in about 11 years, we went from dedicated platform to this variable, you know, um, architecture, which they're just now starting to launch. And they're already saying, mm, maybe we need to go back to dedicated platforms. So there's been a bit of schizophrenia going on with BMW in this last decade. It's unfortunate because I think they were ahead of many automakers uh, back in 2008, 2009, when they said the future is electric, we are going to electrify. And somehow they kind of lost their way. Along right, the yeah. Way. They've been uh, I, they do have a, they did have a big deal though. Actually, I think it was yesterday or maybe possibly the day before they have like a $2 billion investment in uh, North Vault. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Martin? Battery, a cell supply, uh, which they've been, they've been investing in and with uh, North Vault for cell development and 2.2, 2.3 billion uh, dollar deal with North Vault for cell supplies which starts mid, mid decade. I think I, to Tom's point, I think this all comes back to the challenge that we know we've, we've, we've talked to this a few times on this podcast for regular listeners, the challenge out there for the, the established brands that many people know and love and want an EV from because they've always driven them or whatever is, is just how schizophrenic they have been over the time. And if you look at BMW again, a mate with the i3, just incredible foresight to have that and so much changed, uh, you know, and, and, and it may be a coincidence, but it does, you know, all happened around 2014, 15, when a nice chap called Herbert left BMW and went to go run a company called VW. And all of a sudden right. they started making uh, dedicated platforms and, uh, and and he still oversees VW Group, although not the, 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 the brand anymore. And so then a new management come in and now, you know, and only this week, a new management's come in to uh, Audi. have been talking up combustion engines, how they're going to invest heavily in combustion engines at Audi. And you think... That is the benefit of a of a startup company, whatever startup you want to make, whether it's RJ or whether it's Elon or or any of these the, the smaller companies. That is the advantage when you can have that consistency, that lone voice, that single yeah. uh, determined vision of this is where we're going. Everyone get in line behind me because otherwise they're going to go round and round and round and round in circles like this for a long time. It's frustrating for us. It's frustrating for you listening and watching. And they, we just need to be clear. Otherwise, other companies, startups are going to come along and and they really will eat their lunch. And that, I think, at the the fundamental level with BMW is just the management changes and the politics. There was also another article that came out this week on a, a non-EV site. I forget which one it was, but it was a former VP of, uh, of Tesla. And I reported on it on my, my podcast because uh, he gave an interview to this, this website that said, you know, when, when our car, the Model S, I think, failed a NHTSA test back years and years ago, it took them one meeting and five days to agree the fix, re, uh, redesign the part, and then have it pass the, the NHTSA test. And then he said, like, I used to work at, uh, I think it was Audi or a, a VW company. He said, 
this was a six month process when things right. like this went wrong it got political everyone tried to avoid being blamed uh it would everyone was sensitive with everyone's feelings and i think that is the crux of 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 the next few years in the car industry of how many people are going to just grab these companies by the scruff of their neck and drag them into electrification and how many are going to be at the the mercy of politics of keeping everyone happy, whether that's the big unions in Germany or or, or elsewhere, and and that's really going to define the kind of cars we're driving in five years' time. Well, so speaking of like fast changes in Tesla, they have cancelled their uh, sub forty thousand dollar standard range Tesla Model Y. That's like off the website, off the table now, and they're just going to go with a. Uh, you, you'll still be able to get the rear wheel drive version coming up in a few months, according to Elon, with over 300 miles of range. So yeah, we're getting right up against the hour there. So I wanted to throw that in there, make sure we talked about that just a little bit. Um, anything to note about this, Tom, that you, you want to speak about? I don't think it's a, a big news. And I don't, excuse me, I don't think it's a big surprise. You right. know, Tesla's done this before. Um, I think there's a little of them uh, when they announce a vehicle, announcing that there's going to be a, like a lower trim or a smaller battery pack, so that way the starting price can be announced that starting at only $30,000 or $35,000 or whatever, and then that vehicle never coming to market. It's kind of like what happened with the Model S with the 40 kilowatt hour battery pack. I don't right. believe the decision to make that was entirely on low demand. Uh, you know, I think that that was partly, you know, I think that they might have never really intended on making many of them, and they probably like Tesla didn't just realize this week that, wait a minute, it's only going to go 250 miles. Right. That's not enough. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That was the reason that Elon said they were going to stop yeah. making it because it, it wasn't enough range, but they've known that for a while. Of course you think Elon didn't know that. So, you know, I think it's part of the fact that those lo lower trim, smaller battery pack models, um, th they have much smaller margins if they even are profitable. And it costs Tesla a lot to change their, their, their manufacturing lines. You know, it's just so much easier to just put the same battery pack in every car and just, just blaze away with that. And uh, I, so I think that's more of the reason than anything. Right, but I still, I, I mean, Elon usually says when he, when they phase out something like that, he, he just says the demand for it wasn't there. And, you know, I'm pretty sure, I, I imagine that is the case. And I you know I don't think he's really trying to, he doesn't have to, you know, do a lot of hocus pocus. He usually is a pretty straight shooter and he's kind of unfiltered and he's, he says what he thinks and, you know, let, let the cards fall where, where they may. <laughs> but I, I speculated this week that it was a clever Pete piece of perception play the phrase he used was unacceptably low uh, uh yes. to, to 230 250 but his tweet was said unacceptably low and i wonder whether that is using the enormous influence he's got the enormous reach and uh, sway that tesla has over the industry with the perception uh, with the public that or at least with their fans that any car company that comes out with 250 or minus is unacceptably right. low and that could be a a, a nod towards september 27 uh, 22nd battery day Each some one. of the tech they've got off their leave and, and how tesla is positioning itself i remind people of all th this all the time the model y is either 50 or sixty thousand dollars before you start adding autopilot right <laughs> so th these aren't cheap cars these are expensive no. premium cars even if they're not what you would think as premium so th they're not going to be swimming in the 15 or twenty thousand dollar car market anytime soon they can afford to try and get people to think oh that car that you know so and so manufacturer just announced i think got 240 miles well Oh, Elon tells me that's not good enough. I won't buy that one. I wonder if there was some clever play or maybe it was a happy accident. I don't know. That, I don't know. Uh, so we're just about out of time, but I, I wanted to also mention that the Lordstown Motors, uh, they showed off, and you can look this up on Inside EVs, but they showed off the first interior renderings of their electric pickup truck. So it was kind of interesting. It's pretty workaday standard. It's not too fancy. But, you know, it looks like a nice enough place to you spend if you're, you know, you're a working person and, that's your that's your office, and it's fine. But the the big re, big news sort of uh, they buried the lead there on that story, and we have uh, our guy noticed this. Um, originally, they were saying they were going to start production or deliveries possibly as soon as December, but now that's pushed back to next summer. So 
it, which makes sense because we know that they have a lot a lot of work to do yet on their factory and uh, i'm not even sure if they have like really have the money they need to really get things going so it's you know it's a smaller player but it's something to keep an eye on uh and, and speaking of smaller players uh fisker also revealed that uh fisker who, who just actually went public through a reverse uh, acquisition uh, situation with uh, what's it called the Spartan Energy Acquisition Core. It's called like a SPAC. It's a weird, weird way to IPO. So you you know you hook up with a company that doesn't really do anything except exist and got on the market for the purposes of uh, being acquired and creating an IPO. And so yeah, Fisker is now on the stock market, and but it's under I believe it's under Spartan Energy Acquisition Corp, and it's not under Fisker. At least at this point, I need to look into that a bit more. But that's all I could find this morning, and it, the price of that company had shot up somewhat. But anyway, the the bigger news actually was that they are building the Fisker Ocean, uh, which is a uh, compact crossover, not not too small, but not not huge at all. The uh, Fisker Ocean it'll be built on the Volkswagen MEB platform, and we can see that right here if you're watching us on the YouTube. And that's the flexible platform built by Volkswagen that's going to be under the ID3, the ID4, all that stuff. And then from Audi as well, um, uh, Cooper, Seat, Cooper vehicles. So that, and that's going to help them keep the price down, they say, to $30,000, which a lot of people have a hard time believing that Fisker is going to be able to deliver a vehicle that look, and it looks pretty decent too. I like, I like, especially the interior. There's some funky things with the interior that's not my. Not to my taste, but it, you know, it's not bad. It's not a bad looking vehicle. Uh, the interior is super nice, but thirty thousand dollars—that's that would be a crazy <laughs> value if they could pull that off. And uh, yeah, he, and, Henrik and, and yeah, Henrik's been through the ringer, and so he's yeah. he's been through the, the, the bad times with EVs, and and uh, yeah. so I, I want I want to cut him some slack, but he did tweet this week, uh, and I, I follow I follow his tweets, and I he's always insightful. Um, but he's been pumping it in the last seven days. Really, he's been using the the, the hashtag SPAQ as well, and and just right. really like just like it's it's the levels of somebody else who pumps their company a lot on on Twitter without actually making any products. And he and he put a tweet out this week which crossed the line for me when he said, uh, "Show me any luxury SUV that costs less than thirty thousand dollars. It does not exist." And, right. and I wanted to say to him, "You're right." <laughs> Your car does not exist, and it won't for two and a half to three years. So and it might not was, ever at that price either. Yeah, he was trying to say, "Hey, look at our car; it costs thirty. You're so far away from that car. Really smart. They're using someone else's platform. VW yeah. will want to get some money back from all the R and D they put into it. Licensing deal. Very clever. Why? But why build steering racks and and software platforms? Use someone else's and put your stickers on top of it. Yeah, it's it's great for for uh, Volkswagen if they can actually you know increase their volume and. I mean, it's still apparently Fisker does have the financing in place to get this to production. They say now, man, I don't know. It's 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 a, there's well, there's a lot of skepticism. I mean, Fisker he's built vehicles before. He knows what it's like. He knows what the process is involved, and he knows how hard it can be and how things can go wrong. You know, when you you know the port floods and all your cars go up in flames, <laughs> literally, yeah. uh, man. But uh, I don't know. I'm I'm hoping he does it because he's a nice guy and it's a good looking vehicle. And if he can even get close to thirty thousand dollars, you know, it, it's not it's not a, a huge, you know, it's still a win. I think if it's like even thirty eight thousand dollars, you know, which is a, you know, a, quite a bit more, but it's still you know it would be, still be a great value. It would still compete with like the the Kona Hyundai Kona or electric or the uh, Kia Kia Soul and things of that size. Tom, you have something we want to close up real quick. Yeah, no, just just to add that, yeah, I mean, Henrik's a great designer. I, I personally, I think he's one of the be better designers of our time. Um, you know, he still hasn't like brought a company to fruition that lasted, that made. So, you know, I mean, we all know what happened the first time around with the Karma, but um, you know, if he can come close to thirty thousand on this vehicle, it would do fantastic. I mean, I, if he could, if he could sell it at thirty thousand after the seventy five hundred dollars federal tax credit. I think it would, it would it would sell really well. It's a cool looking, um, you know, compact SUV. Kind of looks like reminds me of like a Range Rover Evoque, some somewhere in in in, in that styling. But um, you know, I, I wish him more than Mario. We say this all the time, um, but uh, you know, at thirty thousand dollars with the specs that he's talking about, you know, that's kind of pie in the sky. And to tweet that, you know, 
um, almost mocking other auto manufacturers because they haven't done it when he hasn't done it. Right. That's, um, you know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit folly. <laughs> There's been a lot of that going around recently. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the Twitter sphere. We can't take, uh, you know, Twitter too serious anymore. It's like, uh, you know, how many people put their foot in their mouth, uh, you know, uh, executives, politicians, it's right. pretty crazy. So you have to take it with a grain of salt. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what they do. I think it's a cool vehicle. Um, and uh, if, it, if it does make it to, to production and it's even close to that price, I think it'll sell. Right. Well, that brings us to the end of our show. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh, if you have any comments about any of the topics on today's show, you can comment on the Inside EVs podcast post. Uh, also, the YouTube comment section we'll, we'll be checking into or, or on the inside evs uh, forum podcast thread and you can follow all find and follow all our panelists on twitter uh tom is at tomalog uh martin is at ev news daily and uh, kyle even though he's not here you can find him at out of a spec and he should be here this uh next week uh he had some wi-fi problems apparently and i'm um, i'm dominic underscore y uh so Click, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications and we'll see you all next week. <laughs>